Good afternoon, everybody. Andy White here. What you are about to hear is the fusion of heart, mind, and soul. As I was stumbling over my intro a few moments ago there because I've got so much things going on in front of me. i got computers to the left of me, computers to the in front of me, working the soundboard over here. But anyway, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining in all across the fruited plain and all around the round and spherical globe. If you are tuning in and you would like to join in the conversation, I am streaming live over on my Open Up the Doors Facebook page over at facebook.com uh, slash faithfm91.7. That's uh, facebook.com slash faithfm91.7. If you would like to join in on the conversation over there, please do so. I'd appreciate it. Let us know where you're listening from. Let us know where you're watching from. If, you would, if you're outside of the Faith FM broadcast area on the east end of Long Island, you can stream it on the Internet at HamptonsChristian.com. Uh, just go to HamptonsChristian.com, uh, go to the menu, scroll down to the Faith FM link, and you'll get, um, <clears throat> you'll get the, 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 uh, the streaming over the Internet. And you can simulcast it with the uh, Open Up the Doors uh, Facebook page. You'll get better audio if you, you know, you can just turn, turn, turn the video on over on Facebook Live, turn the sound off and listen to it on the on the internet. You'll get better sound quality because all I'm doing with the uh, with the Facebook Live, I'm just using the internal mic off the iPad. At any rate, if you'd like to uh, email me as well, you can email me at ajwhite777 at iCloud.com. That's ajwhite777 at iCloud.com. And I've got, as always, I always say this, I say this every week, I've got so much on my palette here but um you know what i I, something i wanted to bring up last week and i just never i never got around to it so i'm going to start to show up with it this week because it's really going to set up for the rest of the broadcast what i want to get to but two weeks ago it's about two weeks almost uh my wife and i went to see the the movie unplanned and like i said i wanted to mention it last week but i never i just didn't get around to it but um you need to see this movie folks if you if you haven't seen the movie unplanned I would really encourage you to go, just to go, and before it's run its course, before you know movies run courses for a couple of weeks and you can't see them anymore. Especially since the the, the movie theaters really aren't uh, uh, too thrilled about showing this movie. So if you haven't seen it and it's playing someplace near you, get out and, and go watch go go watch this movie before it's run its its course because the Hollywood industrial complex opposition to the movie they want to pull the plug on unplanned as fast as they can trust me but the movie's got a really powerful uh, really powerful storyline because because it's a true story and you know it, it for those of you who may not know and i i, I kind of think everybody in this audience probably really does know the storyline but unplanned is it's the story it's 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 the story of abby johnson who was a former uh planned parenthood director an executive who worked for Planned Parenthood for many, many years. And she it's her story about how she went from being a Planned Parenthood executive and director and, and supervising over 22,000 abortions to one day witnessing 
really by accident because she had never done it before. But she one day she, she was called in to help with an abortion. And she was holding a thing for the sonogram, the, the scanner for the sonogram. And she, and she saw the baby in the womb very perfectly formed and flinching away from the abortionist's uh, wep- weapons of destruction because that's what they are, his tools of, of, of death. And it broke her. And she left, you know, within a few weeks after that, you know, she, she left Planned Parenthood and she became pro-life. She reached out to, to this group that was, uh, that's this, this group, uh, 40 Days for Life, uh, Sean, Con- uh, Sean Carney is his name, Sean Carney and his group. They used to be, they used to protest out in front of this Planned Parenthood daily and, de- you know, for, for months, years on end. And Abby Johnson got to be friends with them. And when she left Planned Parenthood, she went to them. She reached out to them, and I don't want to, you know, be a, you know, spoiler alert for the movie. But again, it's it's her story, and Abby Johnson went from, you know, serving uh, I shouldn't say serving, but working at Planned Parenthood to starting her own pro life ministry, and then there were none. And she's helped her ministry, and then there were none. She's helped over 500, 500 former abortion workers leave the abortion industry and find new jobs and it's a powerful movie i really recommend it you need to see it um and by the way (laughs) here's something else about about the movie it was given an r rating and there was absolutely really no reason whatsoever in my humble opinion that this movie should have been given an r rating yeah there's there's a couple of scenes where it's bloody but you know what? It wasn't it wasn't terribly graphic at all. And for the few 30 seconds, it was bloody. I've seen far worse MP. Uh, what is that? PG-13 movies. I don't go to the movies much anymore. I don't go to see R movies uh, unless there's something like this, because this was something that that needed to be to, to be seen. But uh, it wasn't there was no reason that the uh, the movie industry should have rated this movie an R. The bottom line is this. They simply wanted to keep. Uh, people away from it. They, they they know a lot of Christians don't go to our movies, so they wanted they wanted to squelch the attendance. They wanted to squelch it at the box office, and they certainly wanted to keep uh, teenagers from seeing this movie. But here is the gross, pathetic uh, irony of the whole thing: because teenagers, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen years old, can go and get an abortion itself without their parents even knowing about it without parental consent they can actually go and get an abortion but they couldn't go see a movie about abortion without their parental consent it's it it, it was hypocrisy to the to the max but you see the honest truth is simply this the planned parenthood uh sycophants in the media in the hollywood industrial complex they just don't want people to see it they really don't even want teenagers to see it they don't want the truth getting out And there's no question, my friends, that this movie is having an impact on people. It really is. I I, I really should have brought this up last week because it's out about two weeks ago. But like I said, I'm going I'm actually going somewhere with what I'm saying. But this this movie is having an impact, a good impact, a positive impact on people. I I, I read in one report the other day how during the preview in, in, in one of the theaters, what the theaters do is they'll, they'll they'll preview the movie. They'll they'll run the movie to make sure the the uh, audio is working right, that the that the film is working right, that all the equipment is working right. So they'll run the movie before they actually open it up to the public. And I was reading how in one movie theater during the testing of the movie, the workers in the movie theater all were attracted and they got interested and they got curious about the movie and they started watching the movie and they all started. T- you know, having a, it, it, they also having a conversation with one another about abortion, and the uh, the testimony went as such that some of the movie workers, some of the theater workers, ch- changed. They went they went from being pro choice to being pro life uh, after watching Unplanned. The movie has been causing more people to get involved, from what I've been reading as well, from uh, for 40 Days of Life, something that's still going on, by the way. 40 Days for, for Life does nonviolent, peaceful protests in front of Planned Parenthoods all over the country. I did two days myself um, earlier in, in March before I came back to work, and it's um, the movie is drawing more, more volunteers out. It's a very, very powerful and impactful movie, and again... If you haven't seen it, go see it. 
uh, if, if I don't know if it's available yet on Netflix or, or Hulu or any of those things. I, that I don't know about. But um, you, you need to you need to go. You need to bring people, and it's it's having an effect, and that's called winning. That's called winning. The movie, despite the intense media opposition, despite an R rating from the MPAA, despite its opposition from big tech censorship, you know, uh, uh, Twitter took the unplanned website down right before it opened up two weekends ago. But with, with all that opposition, the movie still took in over $6 million in its opening weekend. And it was a movie, by the way, that only cost $6 million to make. So in the first weekend that it opened, the movie broke even. It was actually over. And it came in on that weekend, its opening weekend, it came in number five in the box office. It beat out... Um, uh, Captain Marvel, which was a movie that cost $152 million budget it had. But I, I, from what I read last week, the movie came in at number four in the box office receipts last week. So here's the point. Unplanned, even with all the opposition, even with all of uh, of the resistance to it, it's winning. It's winning, folks. Uh, it the, the movie itself also got... Uh, what, what's called an, an A-plus rating from the cinema score. An A-plus rating, from what I understand, is, is it's coveted for movies. It's, 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 it's just a coveted uh, award to get for a new movie, and it received an A-plus rating. Uh, I want to quote some things from some stories with this. Lead actress Ashley Bratcher, if that's how you pronounce her name, who played Abby Johnson, said she was blown away by the film's success. Quote, I am blown away by the public response to Unplanned as well as the box office numbers, uh, she said to the Daily Wire in an interview. She said, not only is it beyond my wildest dreams, but it has surpassed the expectations of critics across the country. We're winning, folks. The truth is winning. She goes on to say, despite biased critic reviews written more like op-eds, the audience has spoken. And I just learned that Unplanned received the coveted, as I just said a moment ago, A-plus cinema score. And while that is truly an honor, she said, the most rewarding thing about this weekend's opening is the flood of messages I've received from people experiencing healing and a change of heart. Because that's what it's about. This is called winning. This is called winning. And I want to keep pressing that point. Because... Regardless of the opposition, the unplanned movie is winning. Despite the, the powerful media and Hollywood industrial complex, the truth is winning out. In a, again, in a, in a statement to the Daily Wire, Abby Johnson pointed to God, of course, for the film's success. She said, look what God has done. I could not be more thrilled with the debut of Unplanned. The reports of healing... And, conver and conversation nationwide are edifying and encouraging. My inbox is filled with stories of post-abortive women who are finding healing through this film, as well as pro-choice people who have started to question their beliefs, as I sa shared a moment ago. These testimonies that are coming in about how the movie is having an effect on people. Folks, I want to say it again. The truth is winning. Now, sometimes, <laughs> I realize, sometimes it may not look like it's winning. Sometimes it may not look like we're winning in the culture war. And it, there's some real battles going on. Sometimes things look bleak and things look dark, and it doesn't look like we're going to win, especially in this world, folks. But let me tell you, folks, <laughs> I read the back of the book. I've read the end of the book several times over, in fact. We win in the end, my friends. We win. And I want to share with you today, because I, I really wanted to bring that out, because I want to share with you today about winning and losing, about real winners and losers. And by the way, before I go on with that, <laughs> BB Netanyahu. Let me uh, let me give a shout out to BB Netanyahu. I don't know if he's I don't know if he's listening to the broadcast or not. Probably not. But hey, if he ever gets to it, congratulations to BB Netanyahu, who has won his fifth term 
of being prime minister of Israel. Historic. He's now the longest elected official in Israeli history of being a prime minister. And he's a winner. He's winning after all the polls were looking like he was losing. As someone once said, it's not over till it's over. Or when the fat lady sings, or both, or whichever comes first, however it goes. But again, things sometimes, they just aren't what they seem to be. Winning, losing. Uh, Sometimes you just can't go by outward observations, my friends. Jesus, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, after going through a litany of bad and terrible things that would come upon this world, in Mark chapter 13, Jesus is talking about the tribulation and the signs of the times right before his return. And the things that would come upon his followers. And we know this time period is coming. We know that this, from what we, we can see, the signs of the times all around us that Jesus spoke about in, this, in, in our age, in our world. Everything that he was talking about is coming to a head. And Jesus, in that chapter of Mark, speaking of the tribulation that would come, a time when, when it would look like that evil was ascending beyond all, uh, be, beyond all unbe- unbelievableness. I've said that so many times. I've always known that things were going to get worse and worse. I share this all the time. But sometimes you look around and you go, man, I, think it would get, I didn't think it would get this bad. I didn't think this would happen. I didn't think society would get this low. I didn't think society would get this demonic. And we see it on a daily basis. We just see it happening. It looks like evil is winning. But Jesus says this to the apostles, to his disciples that day. He said, but take heed. If they're going through this litany of all the things that were going to come upon this world. He says, take heed. I have told you all things beforehand. Over in the Gospel of John, he said, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. And here's the key. When, 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 we don't, when, we, when, when things are looking bad, when it looks like we're losing, when it looks like that, that, that the darkness is, is just overwhelming, remember, Jesus told us that's what it would be like in this world. Jesus, he forewarned us. And he says in, 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 in the Gospel of John, he said, these things I have spoken to you that you would not be made to stumble I think a lot of people are going to stumble in the days ahead because they've been fed a lie, because they've been fed a false gospel, because they're they're believing uh, they're believing in false doctrines. I won't go down that road. I I would be digressing if I went down that road to some degree. But here is the point: Jesus said, "Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service." Hey, don't we see that? Don't we see people killing in the name of their God? Don't we see people today killing major world religions, Islam killing in the name of its God? Thinking that they're doing God a favor by killing the infidels? Jesus said this This is what it was going to be like before he returns. They're going to, they're going to kill you thinking that they offer God service. But he says the same thing in the Gospel of John that he said in Mark. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you, re- you may remember that I told you of them. I'm telling you these things because I want you to understand, to be ready, to be prepared, that your faith fail not. It may look dark. It may look bleak, my friends. But we win. Hallelujah. We win in the end. Stick around. I have a whole lot more to say. I'll be right back. Here's Matthew West. My name is Matthew West. No, my name's Andy White, but here's Matthew West. Matthew West. Hello, my name is Andy White, and you are listening to Open Up the Doors here on Faith FM. It's the fusion of heart, mind, and soul. If you are tuning in, you are listening to uh, WEGB 90.7 and 93.3 in that peak. WEGQ 91.7 in Quag. I am streaming live also over my Facebook uh, 
open up the doors page. If you'd ever like to open up the doors page, go on over there to uh, facebook.com slash faithfm91.7 and please like the page. Give me a shout out from where you're watching from. I'm going through the stream right here. Hey, Debbie from Ohio and Lola, somebody I grew up with in CI years ago. Praise God. Thanks for tuning in. Jimmy Messina, God bless you, brother. Hey, a shout out to Kelly Menino over in West Hampton here on the island. Thanks for joining in there. And I'm just going, hey, you guys got any, any questions or any comments that you'd like to mention? I'll keep an eye on my stream here, and I'll try and answer your questions throughout the broadcast. But I'm talking about winners and losers today. And speaking of winners and losers, uh, I, I, I'm almost reluctant to bring her up because this, this woman, she, she just doesn't s- seem to get it. She just doesn't know how to keep her, her mouth shut. <laughs> Uh, I got to rein it in a little bit. This this woman, Il, Ilhan Omar, she just doesn't know how to stay out of uh, the controversy. I should say. Here's a woman. Uh, she, here's a woman, my friends. This representative from Minnesota, I believe it is, Ilhan Omar. Here's a woman that you would think, on so many levels, ought to behave like a winner, but her ingratitude and her unmitigated goal really shows us what a loser she is. I shared a few weeks ago that Omar had spoken at a CARE conference, the Council of American Islamic Relations. She spoke at a fundraiser, and I shared about that a couple of weeks ago, where she called upon other Muslims to, to make people uncomfortable with their activism and presence in society. And she, she, unrelentlessly, she unrelentlessly, I should say, excuse me, criticizes Israel, always spewing out these anti-Semitic comments. We've been, she's been in the news for weeks, and you, you, she, it's like I said, it's like she doesn't get it. But the other day, another part of the speech that she gave at uh, CARE came out, just the other day it surfaced, and in the speech, she also talked about, well, she disparaged, she, dis, she dismissed in a, in a flippant sort of way the 9-11 attacks that we suffered in 2001, where she just said, some people did something. In fact, let me give you the quote from the, from the uh, speech she gave at CARE. She says, CARE was founded after 9-11 because they recognized that some people did something. And that all of us were starting to lose access to our civil liberties. Well, that in itself really is a tremendous lie. Because I remember, and most of many of you probably remember as well, right after 9-11, when so many people thought, okay, there was going to be this backlash against, against the Islamic Muslim community in America. And there wasn't. In general, Americans don't act that way. And there just wasn't. But she goes on to say, to to add insult to injury, this ingrate, and that's what she is. The more she opens her mouth, the more you see how unappreciative she is of what's been given to her. Like I said, she, uh, on the outside, she should be winning. But she's really losing in her attitude. She's losing in her spirit. Because she went on to complain about being treated as a second-class citizen. She, she's I'm sick and tired, she said, of being treated like a second-class citizen. This is coming from someone who's been elected to Congress. I mean, the cognitive dissonance is stunning, my friends. She trivializes the deadliest terrorist attack in U.S. history uh, at a CARE conference. Mind you, CARE is a front group for the Muslim Brotherhood. Even the United Arab Emirates has designated CARE as a terrorist organization, believe it or not. And Miss Omar, you ought to be celebrating America. You ought to be celebrating because you were, you, you, you were given an opportunity. But you're showing yourself to be a loser. And I want to tell, say, what a pathetic and unthankful person she is. Folks, here's the history in case you don't know it. She fled for her life from a devastating war in Somalia. 
She was holed up in a Kenyan refugee camp and was brought to the United States through the altruism of America and our tax dollars so she could start a new life. And all this unthankful person continually does is to trash and bash the country that gave her a real life, that gave her an opportunity to rise above and be a winner. It's utterly amazing to me, but it's also utterly disgusting to me. The, 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 the amazing ingrat ingratitude, it's despicable. And I want to say, Miss Omar, if you don't repent, <laughs> if you don't repent, you're going to become an even bigger loser than you are manifesting yourself to be now. But as an aside to this, here's something that's a little bit of a win in the culture war, because I'm talking about winners and losers today, folks. But she spoke at CARE. But here's something that happened just a couple of weeks ago. This is a little pushback. This is, this is a win in the culture war, because over in San Diego, California, in a landmark case just a few weeks ago, CARE has been forced out Hallelujah. Care has been forced out of the San Diego Unified School District. A lawsuit was brought against the school district for partnering with Care and allowing the Islamist organization to run a discriminatory and unconstitutional propaganda program in its schools. Oh, but I thought we were being treated like second class citizens. But um, the people that brought the lawsuit won. The court agreed with the assessment. According to the report, the program in question, you ready for this? The program in question gave Muslim students special privileges. Well, wait a minute. I thought you were being treated like a second class citizen. It's a lie. You know, and we do believe, this is America, we are a pluralistic society, and we do believe in equal rights, and uh, like I've said many, many times, and I want to be clear, I don't have problems with Muslim people. Muslim people are not the enemy. Islam is. Islam is, is, is a religion out of hell, but Muslims need to hear the gospel, and I wish every Muslim would come to Jesus Christ and to the truth. Having said that, this is America, and they could worship uh, in their religion or no religion, as much as they want. It's equal rights, but special privileges are not equal rights. And this is why CARE lost the lawsuit, because the program in the San Diego school district gave CARE the power to change the district curriculum. Can you believe that? I mean, now, you got to realize that the liberals there in San Diego, San Diego, they were all in on this. They didn't think there was anything wrong with this. Oh, yeah, let's bring in a uh, let's bring in an Islamic uh, curriculum. Let's give the Muslim students special privileges. All at the same time, where they've thrown the Bible out of school, where you're not allowed to pray in school, where you're not allowed to have Christian uh, uh, gatherings in school. So who's being treated like a second class citizen, my friends? But I digress a little bit. But the school district had handed care power to change the curriculum to make sure that Islam was looked upon more favor favorably. I mean, really? I don't even... Uh, oh, I was about to say... I was about to say that I didn't know how long this program was there, but it's right here in the story. The program was begun in April of 2017, so it was there for almost two years. But students and parents were made to watch biased videos that care officials had brought in. Care officials were allowed to teach students and teachers about Islam, and students were trained, quote, how to become allies with Muslim students. What is that supposed to be? That's a quote. How to become allies with Muslim students. How's about just treating people as, as human beings with dignity and respect no matter who they are? Because we're all created in the image and likeness of God. Yes, even sinful man. But I won't go down that road right right now. But I, I, I just won't go there. Let me, let me, let me, I can't digress today. The program was based on false evidence. They brought this program in to the school district in San Diego. In the wake of President Donald Trump's electoral victory, Muslim students were subjected to Islam, uh, Islamophobic bullying, or so they were claiming. However, here's the truth. 
the truth does win if people seek it out. They were complaining after Trump won of Islamophobia. That's why, they, that's why CARE brought in this program. But the state records that were brought into as evidence to the court indicated there was no evidence of such bullying in the district schools. The court ruled that the program was unconstitutional because it violated the First Amendment's establishment clause by favoring one religious group over another and mixing government with religion, something that that the left has been hammering Christians over for the last 50 years. But it's okay with liberals embracing the Islamic community. But under the terms of the ruling, the school district is required to permanently drop the program and has been prevented from allowing care to be involved in school activities in the future. Winning! Sometimes you win a few, and sometimes you lose a few in this world. But this is called winning. But sadly, the hit parade keeps on coming, folks. I'm going to move on to another guy this past week who should be winning, but he's acting like a big-time loser. And I'm speaking of Pete Buttig- uh, Buttigieg. Buttigieg, I think, is how he pronounces his name. This mayor uh, from South Bend, Indiana, who's running for president, who's openly gay and married to uh, another guy, Pete Buttigieg. Last week, Pete Buttigieg questioned and questioned and criticized President Trump regarding his Christianity. But based on what? Because Buttigieg condemns Trump with the same scriptures that condemn his homosexual style of living. So try and figure that one out. Buttigieg then goes after Vice President Pence in a completely unprovoked and gratuitous attack, a smear attack after Mike Pence. There was no reason for for, 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 for Buttigieg to attack Mike Pence. There really wasn't. It was gratuitous completely. And uh, to, to quote... To quote uh, Pete Buttigieg in this uh, speech he gave to an LGBTQ crowd uh, gathering, he said, quote, my marriage to, to Chasen has made me a better man. And yes, Mr. Vice President, it has moved me closer to God. The, Mike Pence has never said anything about the guy's relationship. Never. In fact, when you look at the reports, when you look at the reporting, they had a good, they had a good relationship when Mike Pence was, was governor of, of Indiana. This was a unprovoked gratuitous smear attack. And he goes on to say to uh, Vice President Pence, quote, I can tell you that if me being gay was a choice, it was a choice that was made far, far above my pay grade. And that's the thing I wish the Mike Pence's of the world could understand, that if you have a problem with who I am, your problem is not with me. Your quarrel, sir, is with my creator, end quote. Pete Buttigieg, it's unprovoked, gratuitous attacks like this that make you a loser and not a winner. Losing, because let's get this straight, with all due respect, actually, your argument is with God. No, we're not arguing with God about it. You are. It's you, Mayor Buttigieg, who reject both his word and his creation. Unless, of course, you want to twist it for your own agenda and purposes. But it is you who violate his natural law. So don't, don't insinuate that God violated his own word and nature. Because it's a lie. Don't blame God for your choices. Don't blame God for your sin. Because you're worshiping a God of your own imagination, my friend. Again. You might look like you're winning in this world, but you're losing. And you need to open up your eyes to the truth of the Word of God and not use it to bash other people while excusing yourself. There are some other scriptures that, that talk about that, by the way, where Jesus talks about, and, and who are you to, to uh, take the, the law, to, to, to take the splinter out of your brother's eye when you got a log in your own eye? That's Christianity. Those are for, for, for Christian relationships. Again, it was, uh, it was uh, a really, really gratuitous slam. And I'm saying all that, folks, to say this, really. There are those who look like they're winning in this life. 
But I want to tell you, they're losing. And there are those who look like they're losing in this life, but they're winning. Think of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. Jesus talks about, I'll read it, and I'll just read a little bit of it. Can't go through the whole story, but most of you will know it. But in Luke 16, Jesus says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And Excuse me, and being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime, you received good things. Looked like he was winning. Looked like he was on top of the world. And he was in this world. The rich man. Likewise, Lazarus in his lifetime received evil things. Looked like he was a real loser. He had a lot of problems, Lazarus. But now he is comforted. And you are tormented. Some think that this is a parable. In fact, in my Bible, it says, the parable of the rich man of Lazarus. But I take issue with that. Because, number one, the Scripture never says it was a parable. Many times, Jesus would say he was speaking in a parable. There's nothing in this story that says it was a parable. However, even if it was a parable, what's its point? Folks, hear me out on this. Because parables aren't fables. Parables aren't fairy tales. Jesus' parables were always based on reality. Stories that easily paralleled real life experiences. That's what made them powerful. That's what made them a real teaching tool. Because people could relate to them in, in a real life situation. The average person could understand the meaning because it reflected reality the analogy in all of jesus's parables was based in reality not in fantasy hell's a real place i was uh looking at a debate the other day on facebook where the debate was on eternal punishment the debate was on hell and people so many people saying oh there isn't real fire oh it's not a real place somebody pointed out that that, that luke 16 was quote unquote uh, a parable in their mind and I was shaking my head going, <laughs> Jesus didn't make something up. It's not Aesop's fables. The analogy and the teaching is real. There is conscious, physical torment in a place of eternal punishment. And we, and we need to wake up to the reality of that. And understand, which is what Jesus was bringing out in Luke 16. You might think you're high and mighty in this world. You might think you're winning in this world. But apart from God, you're losing if you don't have God. That's the whole message of Ecclesiastes. The whole message of Ecclesiastes is that God does give us uh, a life and God does give us blessings and God does give us, give us uh, you know, the goodness, the good things of this world to enjoy from the hand of God. But if, we, if he gives them to us and he's not in our lives, to paraphrase the whole book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, it's all vanity. It's all vanity. Because life without God is losing. But life with God is winning, my friends. Stick around. I'll be right back. Here's a tune called Ready to Fly. <laughs> Right here on 
on Faith FM, WGB 90.7 and 93.3 in Napique, WGQ 91.7 in Quag. Thanks for joining in, everybody, all across the Fruited Plain on this wonderful Open Up the Doors Thursday. Hey, I am streaming live on my Open Up the Doors Facebook page. Go, go on over there and join in the conversation, join in the fun. If you never liked the Open Up the Doors page, please like the page. It's uh, facebook.com slash faithfm91.7. You can also email me at ajwhite777 at icloud.com. I also have, by way of reminder, I have a YouTube page. Please, if you've never subscribed to the Open Up the Doors YouTube page, you can just Google it. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe Debbie could put the, uh, the the link up there on, on Facebook Live. But if you're not on Facebook Live, you won't see the link. But you can just Google uh, Andy White. Uh, in the Google search engine, and you'll you'll find open up the doors. And if you've never subscribed to the uh, the YouTube page, please subscribe. And there's a little bell there too. When you subscribe, you can click on that bell, and it'll give you notifications when these broadcasts and other things, sermons I preach on Sunday, or other things, miscellaneous things that I like to post there on YouTube, you'll be notified when uh, something is posted to YouTube. So again, please visit the open up the doors YouTube page and subscribe to the page but uh, i've only got a few minutes left and i'm talking about today losing and winning losers and winners read a headline the other day the headline read canadian tribunal fines bill whatcott fifty five thousand dollars for expressing christian views on transgenderism that was the headline Last week, the uh, report says that British, the British Columbia Human Rights Tribunal fined Christian activist Bill Watcott $55,000 for the crime of misgendering. Ooh, that's a crime, misgendering. They ordered him to, quote, refrain from committing the same or a similar contravention. And I read, a, I read the full story. It's a Christian brother. He's out street witnessing. He's out handing out tracts. He's out handing out flyers. Somebody was running for a political position that used to be a man, was now saying he was a woman, and this brother in the Lord was calling him out. So he got fined $55,000. And the tribunal declared that what cots, though the statements were true, Watcott didn't say anything that wasn't true, but it caused injury to the cross-dressing, cross-dressing man's dignity, feelings, and self-respect, and therefore Watcott must be punished. Losing? No. I'll get to that in a moment. It looks like he might have been losing. But the tribunal noted that the truth is no defense. Let that sink in. Folks, we are in a world where there is a criminalization of sanity and the normalization of insanity. It's the spirit of the Antichrist. And Bill Watcott lost $55,000 for standing up and speaking up for the truth. But I want to tell you, he's a winner despite how it looks. For the Bible says, For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? This is called winning, my friends. On the cross, it says in Colossians that Jesus, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumph, triumphing over them in it. The it is the cross. For all outward appearances, Jesus, nailed and hanging up on that cross, looked like the ultimate loser. But no, 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 my friends. He was disarming and triumphing and making a public spectacle, not of himself, but of the lying powers of darkness. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. The paradox of Scripture is this, my friends. Lose your life and you'll save it. He who dies will live. He who gives away what he has will increase what he has. That's the paradox of Scripture. Is there going to be some pain and some suffering along the way? Sure. Paul writes in Corinthians, Therefore we do not lose heart. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Do things look bleak? Fret not, my friends. We win. The psalmist said, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Fret not, fret not, fret not because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. 
for evil doers shall be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Are you waiting on the Lord, my friends? Folks, it may not look like we're winning when you look around this world. When you look around and see how things are spiraling downward, seemingly almost out of control. It may not look like we're winning, but we win. For this is which overcomes the world, even our faith. If you endure to the end, you win. If for the joy set before you, you endure the cross, you win. If you remain steadfast and immovable, even in the midst of your darkest trial, you win. I know some of you right now, personally, you're fighting a battle with sickness. You're fighting a battle with cancer. And some of you, in your flesh, in your body, you're losing that battle. I have a dear friend many, many, many years ago who lost his battle to cancer. But he kept the faith until the end. He, he's, you're winning when you stand in your darkest trial and say, though, though, though God slay me, yet will I trust him. You win in the end, my friends. It may not look like you're winning at the moment. But I'll read it again. For a momentary, a light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us. A glorious, eternal weight. Fret not. There are real winners in this world, and there are real, real losers. And it may not look like you're winning at the moment. But if God is for you, who can be against you, my friends? For those of you who know the Lord Jesus Christ and you endure to the end, you win! It's called winning, and I got to run. God bless everybody. Thanks for tuning in for another edition of Open Up the Doors. Oh.